Welcome to part 8 of Majestic Major, a model aircraft project. In this one I will be dismantling the engine to replace the bearings and repair the slight damage to the bearing housing, plus fitting a commercial power panel for fueling and starting the engine. Before I start this episode there are one or two things I would just like to point out. With the exception of the MIG welder sent to me by Machine Mart, everything that you see on my channel either belongs to a customer or it's something that I've bought to make the video. Owing to the COVID-19 restrictions, I've not had much working from customers for a while. So instead, I've been on a sort of permanent shopping spree buying things that I can work on. And this series is not about steam engines, just in case you haven't noticed. I cannot make every video about a steam engine. There are only so many permutations of working on miniature steam engines. I do like a little bit of diversity. Anyone who is unhappy at the fact that this is not a steam engine video, it may even be a good idea to have a look at the other 1600 videos that are on my channel, which feature steam engines. Because I make a video every day, the videos have to be about what I'm doing at any given time. This model aircraft series will be quite short, 10 to 15 episodes maximum, whereas my steam engine videos are a lot longer. The one on the Simplex Great Western Prairie Tank is now on episode 86. Yes, episode 86. This clip, by the way, is from the previous episode where I'm running the engine on my testbed. And to be perfectly honest, this is definitely the next best thing to a steam engine. I do like these old open rocker four-stroke engines. In the last clip, as I pointed out in the last episode, you can see that the front part of the crankshaft is wobbling about. So first of all, I need to remove the prop spinner. And in this clip, I'm wrestling with a hub puller that's far too big for the job. I persevered and finally I got it to fit in place and by tightening the bolt, the prop spinner was removed without any violence. And look at the state of the bearing underneath the prop spinner. This is not only oily and gummed up, it's rusty. The time has come to remove the front part of the crankcase. I'm going to be really careful with this because I do not want to break it. The first thing to do is to remove all four of the allen bolts that hold it in place. And as I do this, I'm putting all the parts in a plastic box, just so I don't lose them. This next part of the job is critical. I need to separate the front part of the crankcase from the main crankcase. I've put the front part on a piece of mahogany, because I do not want to stress out the front part of the crankcase during this next operation. I'm using a Stanley knife blade. Hitting a Stanley knife blade with a hammer is not recommended, and you must wear eye protection and only tap it gently. Eventually the seal is broken and I can remove the front part of the crankcase. This process is very similar to removing parts from a steam engine, except the parts are less rusty. The good news is I managed to do this job without destroying the gasket. The large bearing on the crankshaft came out quite easily. The smaller one was slightly more difficult and I machined up a piece of brass tube to make sure I didn't mark the inside of the aluminium crankcase. From this underside view you can see the very fine flange around the edge of the crankcase, but at the other side, the top part, it was damaged. It looks like in the past someone has had a go at removing the prop spinner using a screwdriver between the crankcase and the prop spinner. I fitted the crankcase in the chuck of my small Myford ML7R lathe and very carefully machined away the damaged part of the flange. This clip showing the turning operation is running at 400% or four times normal speed. The reason for this is I was very gentle with the part and turning away the damaged flange took quite a long time. I finished off the job using some wet to dry sandpaper to remove the sharp edges. This is as far as I'm going to strip down this engine. I'm only really concerned with the main crankshaft bearings. In the next part of the job, I'll be putting some of the parts in my ultrasonic cleaner. But before that, to soften the very badly gummed up parts, I'm going to put them in some gun wash. This is like cellulose thinners, but it's used for cleaning spray guns. The crankshaft goes in first, and as you can see, that's in a bit of a state too. This is followed by the prop driver and the small collet that holds that in place. I also drop the front part of the crankcase into the mix as well. Using some gun wash with a paintbrush, I gave the internal part of the engine as good a clean as I possibly could. As I mentioned earlier, apart from being very badly gummed up with old oil, 
the steel parts were quite rusty. I might even put this bit in my ultrasonic cleaner too. But for the moment I'm getting the thick oil out of the way. As this is an old engine, the oil could be castor oil. In fact, thinking about it, it does smell a bit like that. But either way, you would expect the oil to be fairly gummy on an engine of this age. After giving the parts a good clean using gun wash, I put them in the plastic box. And in this clip, the parts are strategically positioned behind the Stuart triple expansion engine. This is a power panel. It's not as good as some that I've had in the past, but it should do the job. This particular power panel allows the connection of an electric starter to start the engine. It allows you to attach a wired type of glow clip. There's also a connection for a rechargeable glow clip. And the good thing about this power panel is that it has a fuel pump built into it. All I need to do is fit it into this box along with a battery. This is one of a few nicely made empty wooden boxes that I bought from RDG Tools many years ago. I've used this particular box for a power panel before. To complete this job, I made one removable framework to support the power panel and another small framework to support the battery to stop it moving about. Here you see the finished job, very simple, no frills, 100% functional, leaving some space at the end for somewhere to put the fuel tubing after I've finished using it. This wooden box fits inside my larger box, along with all the bits and pieces that I need to fly a model plane. The rubber bands are to hold the wings and tail on the vintage Majestic Major model. This is a restraint that I push into the ground to stop the model moving. Everything fits very neatly into the box with room to spare, including my electric starter and my glow plug spanner. And things like this, one of my two wired glow clips. The meter on the power panel shows just how much current the glow plug on the engine is taking. This small aluminium thing is a fuel filter. I don't generally fit fuel filters in the fuel line to the engine from the tank on board the plane. This fuel filter is fitted on the end of the piece of silicone rubber tubing that's going to go down into the bottle of fuel. This seems to work for me and I never have fuel problems. And that's it for this episode. Stay healthy, thanks for watching and I hope you found it useful. Please take the time to visit my Mainstream Models website and click on the section of the website that says Video Playlists. And by doing that you can find other videos that you may like to watch. And by using the playlists you can actually watch the videos back to back.